Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> we welcome you on the 4th of July, but it is also the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. We welcome our new visitors we have today. Please sign our friendship booklet, the little pad in the pews. Uh, members, please also sign that pad. If anybody knew Lorraine Muller, uh, she passed away yesterday. So her family will be on our prayers today. Our opening hymn is one of my favorite, and we're using my favorite verses, which are the original verses of Eternal Father Strong to Save. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. This is my resting place forever. 
Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. pray. O God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Good morning. The Old Testament is from Ezekiel chapter 2. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I must Go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. 
God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though I, if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was giving, given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, I should, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Uh, it says seat, but let's stand for God bless our native land.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Okay, you're either going to love or hate this first paragraph. <laughs> In the words of Garth Brooks, <laughs> Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Remember when you're talking to the man upstairs that just because he may not answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. If you were alive in the 1990s, you heard that song a lot. <laughs> uh, when Garth wrote that, he was the co-writer co of that song, uh, even if he was unaware of it, he was ripping off St. Paul from our text, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, which is about Paul rejoicing in an unanswered prayer. Paul's unanswered prayer was that he had a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So everybody asks and too many people answer the question, what was Paul's thorn? There is no way of knowing. Scripture and Paul do not give us enough information to even make an educated guess. I got two things to say about that. It doesn't matter what his thorn was, and that's not the point of it anyway. Uh, to the point that it doesn't matter what his thorn was, this is important. Not knowing is a blessing because not knowing means it could be anything. And that makes this text universal, true for all people. Limiting it to a specific thing would reduce the effectiveness and applicability of the text and harm its gospel message. Paul is talking about himself specifically to comfort you in your personal thorn of failure and sin. To my other point, what the thorn was is not the issue. The issue is pride and conceitedness. I have and will often analyze things in terms of the Scylla and Charybdis, two Greek sea monsters that you had to sail in a very narrow lane to avoid getting eaten by one or the other. The two monsters in Christianity are despair and pride. Lutheranism is tough. It is sailing a very narrow channel with horrible danger if you sail too far to the right or the left. Despair is the ugly monster with ugly teeth and tears people to shreds. Pride is the beautiful monster with shiny teeth that tear people to shreds. God is found in the middle with his forgiveness, grace, and love. Veer off into despair and you lose forgiveness. Veer off into pride and you lose grace. It is impossible to lose God's love. Not even pride nor despair can do that. Um, God's love is independent of whether we believe in it or not. And God's love is what will take you out of the ugly mouth of despair or the beautiful mouth of pride, both of which are horrible monsters. Paul here is not addressing despair. He mentions his own desperation to get rid of his thorn, but his point is to warn about pride and conceit. So if I stick with the text, I got to drop the despair part. It can be summed up quickly anyway. Despair is when you believe your sins are too big to be forgiven, ending, ending up in great sadness and hopelessness. So far, despair. But Paul's sole concern here is pride. Despair is blunt and obvious. It's an ugly monster with scary teeth that you clearly want to avoid or get out of its crushing, sharp tooth mouth. Pride is trickier and less obvious because it involves delusion or believing something that isn't true. Pride is believing you are a super Christian with no faults. You've got sin conquered. Your works are perfect. You cannot fail. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
but it's a pretty delusion. Despair makes you feel really bad, but pride makes you feel really good. Despair is uncomfortable. It's absolute torture. Pride is as cozy as can be. That's the delusion that you're perfectly okay. It's not true. You're supposed to be safely sailing in God's channel where grace and forgiveness dwell, but instead you're in the pretty monster's mouth. And even a pretty monster's mouth is not a place where you want to be. St. Paul was flying high. Literally, he was given a visit to heaven. Either in the body or out of the body, he does not know, God knows. He was already doing fantastic work, and then God gave him that, an inexplicable vision of what grace and faith would bring him. He got to see the finish line, the award stand, and the billions of gold medals awaiting each saint who makes it across the line, having traveled the narrow path of grace and faith. There are no silver or bronze medals uh, at the finish line of Heaven's Gate, by the way. Everybody who finishes in Christ finishes first, just like Jesus did. Anyway, many believe Paul's thorn was repetitive, as were his requests to be rid of it, three being just a symbolic number for many. When Paul started veering off into pride, God twisted his thorn to get him back in line into the narrow channel of grace. Because with grace, you're not relying on yourself or your own abilities or your own success. Pride is 100% uh, about relying on yourself with mere lip service to Jesus. 100% about relying on your own abilities, unwittingly despising Jesus and his cross. It's 100% about relying on your own successes. Tears can be a measuring stick for where you are. Inconsolable tears, that's despair. Occasional yet control, consolable tears, that's repentance and faith. With pride, at best, you have only crocodile tears, but more likely no tears at all, because you never consider your failings and never repent of your sins. And with pride, you don't rely on Jesus. You're too occupied relying on yourself and what you can do. Your prayers can be a subtle trap for pride. Your church attendance can be a convenient ploy for pride. Those are the most dangerous pride traps because they're the prettiest, most godly seeming ways of utterly rejecting Christ and believing only in yourself. Your prayers can be a measuring stick for where you are. Despair has angry prayer, if any at all. The narrow channel of God has sincere prayers that ask for things, not just forgiveness, but also daily bread kind of things. Pride has prayers of self-congratulation or thanks to God for making you such a wonderful Christian. The higher you climb, the farther you can fall. St. Paul climbed all the way to the third heaven. God gave him that gift, but he kept him humble. God gave him a thorn in his flesh. The lesson, avoid getting a big head. Some say Paul's thorn was a really bad headache. That's pathetic, it's too little. Some say it was Paul blaspheming. That's going too far. Uh, Paul could not have simultaneously been an apostle and a blasphemer. But everything in between is fair game, even if you don't like to think Paul could have had certain sins. Everything except blasphemy, which is the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit, is fair game so that Paul's thorn could be the same as yours. Paul's thorn has to be your thorn for the gospel of this text to work. If Paul's thorn is your thorn, then Paul's conclusion is your conclusion, and it's a good one. 
You get the word of God directly applied to you and your life, your every thought, word, and deed. God says to you, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That comforted Paul, so it should comfort you. Paul had a bad thorn, a very messenger of Satan hitting him. The Greek word literally means to be given a, mon- a knuckle sandwich, to, to be hit with the closed fist with the knuckles in the face. <laughs> uh, but Paul was still a Christian. Paul was still forgiven. Paul was still an apostle, arguably the greatest one. Paul was still saved because if he ain't in heaven, ain't nobody in heaven. St. Paul advises the narrow path of Jesus where you believe in him enough not to despair because you believe you're forgiven. And you love him enough not to become conceited with pride because Jesus paid for your sins on the cross, not you by your filthy rags of works. But remember, God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. We were saved by weakness. We weren't saved by a mighty army with tens of thousands of soldiers on horses who always win. No, we were saved by a single man who lost everything and was beaten to a pulp before being nailed to a cross. Weakness saved us, not strength. But with Jesus, weakness is strength. With Jesus, poverty is wealth. With Jesus, foolishness is wisdom and the like. The Scylla monster of despair makes sense. You know your own sins and failings, so you despair. The Charybdis monster of pride makes sense. Just look at your works and prayers and church attendance. You are so wonderful. The narrow channel between them of full grace and true repentance and strong faith and, mind you, good works done with the proper attitude of humbleness is the channel where God dwells and where salvation is found. I'm sticking with the waterway talk because the Christian life is a life in a boat that floats on waters that are occasionally rough. But Jesus is in that boat, asleep on a cushion, and he cares. Despair would have you doubt that. Pride would make you not care. Faith cares that Jesus is in your boat, and though he's sleeping, you believe he will wake up and save you when necessary and when the final time comes. Because Jesus' boat crashed into the cross where he died and then sailed as a funerary boat into a stone tomb. But in three days, he woke up and saved us all. He knows about your thorn or thorns, plural. He cares. He forgives you. If he didn't forgive every thorn, then he might have been able to forgive Paul's thorn, but it would have stopped there. The forgiveness wouldn't reach you. Forgiveness only reaches you if Paul's thorn is possibly any given thing that you suffer from. Sin generally is universal. There's only 10 commandments and only 10 categories of sin we can do. But in the grace of God, forgiveness is universal. Anybody can receive it. Christ died for all. Christ died for all because if he left out even one person, the despairing would instantly assume that one person was them. So then Paul's thorn is whatever you've got Because if anything was excluded, you'd assume it was your sin. But I said I wasn't going to talk about despair. I failed. I didn't lie. I simply failed. (laughs) It worked its way into the body of the sermon. So I'll end with the admonition, beware of pride. It's one of the two things that will destroy your faith in Christ. Pride, though, is a forgivable sin. If it's your thorn, just beware of it. When you see it happening, come back down to earth and trust in Christ for 100% of your salvation. In his name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
We stand and say the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son endured rejection in this world. You lead us likewise through a hostile world that shows no honor to your church or its wisdom. Do not let us lose heart, steal us for opposition, and let us rest confidently on what you, what you Lord, have said. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, soften the hearts in every home. Turn parents and children toward each other in love and patience. Banish the spirit of impudence, stubbornness, and rebellion from all. Sanctify us in your truth. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Almighty God, protect and defend our nation from its enemies. Support our leaders and preserve them from temptation. Through the work of all civil authorities, enable us to live a quiet and peaceful life according to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, in our weakness, we are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient for every need. Give comfort to those whose pain is chronic, whose sustained suffering is unknown, who wrestle with difficult thorns in body or mind, and who are tempted to despair. Hear our prayers especially for healing, for Levi Kruger, a small boy who is very sick, Lynn Langerer, who is recovering very well, and Sue, a relative of Karen Larson. For all our homebound, for our military members, especially our military chaplains, for safe travel for everyone who is traveling this holiday weekend, and for the family of Lorraine Mueller at her death, that they may be comforted. In weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, let us boast in Christ and his cross by which we and our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have sustained our nation in the past and continue to bless us. We recall how so many have given their lives for the cause of freedom. Men and women continue to sacrifice and serve in the armed forces. Today we pause to reflect and to honor those who gave or who continue to sacrifice so much in the defense of our freedom to be faithful. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. You can bring the offering up and we sing the offertory.
We pray as Jesus taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. All right. Church office is closed Monday, July 5th for the holiday weekend. Um, I might be in the office if you really need something. Um, I probably won't be there past lunchtime, though. Um, classroom painting at the school is scheduled for Tuesday and Wednesday, July 6th and 7th, beginning at 8 a.m. Come and paint with us. It's not detailed painting. It's, it's, it's just big, broad walls. So, uh, The Tuesday Bible study is still ongoing at 9 a.m. Come join us. The topic is four perils of bulls. Four Parables of Jesus. Adult membership class is going on. We're well into it now, but it's Thursdays at 9.30 to 11.30. Um, if you have prayer requests and, and, and you send them early in the week, not, not on Saturday, uh, there's prayer at trinityoshkosh.org is an email address where you can send prayer requests. Please also note if you'd like the prayer group to include your request in their prayers as well. The July Voice of Trinity is available at the back of church and also at the Welcome Center. This also has been emailed to those who have email addresses in our database and have asked to receive them. Check out the information booklets in the spindles by the Welcome Center. You'll find lots of information on Christian symbols, addiction, suicide, angels, baptism, Holy Communion, fellowship, etc. Our sister congregation, although it might actually be our daughter congregation, Good Shepherd, is hosting worship in the park on Sunday, July 11th at Menominee Park. Lunch will be served after worship. Please bring your own chairs. This is not to be confused with our worship in the park, which is Sunday, August 29th. The Reverend Robert Zick, uh, second vice president of the South Wisconsin District will be our preacher. Uh, we will be celebrating our 165th year in ministry on, at both the school and the church. Our closing hymn is Onward Christian Soldiers. Mm -hmm. 